Frequency Podcast Network. Stories that matter, podcasts that resonate. Not many stories can lay claim to changing the trajectories of both an entire industry and of the animal kingdom. In fact, I can really only think of one. Jaws by Peter Benchley is a novel that turns 50 this summer. That means 50 years of blockbuster films of which Jaws is widely regarded to be the first one. It means half a century of sharks being the first things on people's minds when they enter the ocean, which means half a century of the creatures being demonized because of it. Benchley eventually spent the rest of his life trying to change the narrative his story had created. And while sharks perhaps haven't completely rehabilitated their image, we certainly understand them better today. Which is a really good thing, especially here, because Atlantic Canada is becoming home to more and more great white sharks. So many, in fact, that shark caution signs are being raised at some beaches for the first time ever. So what is driving the surge in the great white population in the Northwest Atlantic? Is it actually leading to more shark-human encounters or more attacks? And what do we need to learn to keep ourselves safe and protect these creatures who, after all, are not man-eaters? The vast majority of the time. I'm Jordan Heath Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Fred Wariski is the executive director of the Ocean Tracking Network at Dalhousie University in Halifax. Hi, Fred. Hello. Thank you for your invitation. Oh, you're most welcome. I want to start by asking you, since um, this is obviously your area of expertise, did you know that this is the 50th anniversary of Jaws? And have you read the book or seen the film? Yes, I was aware it was the 50th anniversary. And when I first saw the film and when it first came out, I was taking a summer semester at the University of Arizona in Tucson in the middle of the desert, and people were so scared of sharks that they would not head to the washroom. <laughs> As somebody who loves uh, marine life and, you know, who follows sharks, um, what do you think of the legacy of that film and book in terms of what it's done for those animals? It has certainly imprinted our society with a particular view on sharks. And to some degree, we've been working very hard to try to undo that over time and put it back on something that's a little more sane, shall we say. I want to ask you um, some questions about shark activity that I understand we've been seeing in the oceans off of Atlantic Canada, which is the real reason we have you on the phone, not just to uh, just to chat about Jaws. Historically, when we go back years how common have great white sharks been uh, in those oceans? So the story of the great white shark population is one where it got hammered, probably as bycatch mostly, and a variety of fisheries targeting other species like long lines for pelagics like tuna. Because it is a long live species that matures very late and only has a few pups each time that it reproduces, when you begin removing these animals from the population, the population crashes really quickly. So 20, 30 years ago, um, there were very few of these white sharks left. They had been hit by this population depression caused by the fishery removals. And now what we're looking at is an apparent resurgence in the population. There have been conservation measures employed both in the United States and in Canada to try to bring our shark populations back. And we're beginning to see some tangible signs that that is happening. So numbers are growing. When you say that numbers are growing, um, how do you track these sharks both at like a population level in terms of the total number, but also in terms of like where they're going and what their habits are? So we'll start with the second part first, which is we track them using electronic tag systems. And there are a couple of different types that are out there. Um, the one that I spend most of my time working with is called acoustic telemetry. Here, what you do is you put a tag that it puts out a little sound signal, goes beep, 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 beep. 
And in that beep, beep, beep pattern is a unique ID code that identifies the animal. And sometimes you can put sensors like the temperature and the depth on them as well. And every time that tag is within receiver range of an acoustic receiver that's moored in the ocean, the date and time that the tag was detected would be recorded as well as the temperature or the depth or whatever else the sensors have on board. So we maintain a network of about 3,000 acoustic receiver units globally right now at the Ocean Tracking Network where I work here. And there are another 17 to 20,000 of them that are out there maintained by other people that we bind all together with a data system to let us look at worldwide movements of highly migratory animals, including sharks. How highly migratory are they? Oh, quite migratory. The uh, white sharks here in the east coast of North America will come into Canadian waters during the spring, summer, and autumn, and it's a feeding migration. So we're cold in the winter. We don't have a lot of food production that's going on at that particular time. And it's also hard for these animals to cope with cold temperatures. So they head south. And when we talk about south, we're talking southern United States into the Caribbean and into the Gulf of Mexico. But then they will turn around and come back again the following summer. I see. And I realize I didn't uh, let you finish your answer there. How, how do you track them um, on a population level so you get a sense of how many sharks are in our waters? So the Atlantic White Shark Conservancy, based in Cape Cod, Massachusetts, has been wrestling with trying to figure out how many white sharks are out there in the Northwest Atlantic Ocean right now. And they came up with a really kind of unique system where they were able to do something called a mark recapture estimate that incorporates the use of these acoustic tags and the detections of the acoustically tagged animals in order to come up with an estimate. So for the first time, we have actually got a number to talk about, and that is over a four-year period off of Cape Cod, there were about 800 of these white sharks that came through that particular area. And that's obviously a minimum number. If we're guessing about how many are out there, Greg Skomol, also in Massachusetts, working for the Division of Marine Fisheries for the state of Massachusetts, was quoted on camera as saying he thinks there might be tens of thousands of them. Are there any other reasons that uh, we're seeing more sharks this far north, or is it simply that Newfoundland and other Atlantic provinces stopped fishing them. I mean, unintentionally, of course, but but stopped fishing so much and fewer of them were killed. Or are or, or warming oceans also uh, making these waters more attractive to uh, these sharks? So the warming is probably helping a little bit, although for things like the white shark and the poor beagle, both of those species have a way of capturing heat that comes from the contraction of their muscles and funneling it into the center of their body to keep them warm compared to the temperatures of the water outside. So they've always been able to cope with relatively cool to cold water. In my opinion, there's probably less a a climate change signal than a population resurgence signal that we're picking up right now. Hmm. And it's a little hard as well to tease out the fact that we've got a lot more people on the water a lot more of the time now. A lot more sightings are being reported, but it's in part due to the fact there are a lot more people out on the water doing kayaking or they're doing stand-up paddle boarding or they're water skiing or doing all of these other things that people do on the water. What kind of encounters have we been seeing as those numbers rise? Um, have people been injured uh, in any attacks in these waters? If you mean off of Canadian waters, um, no. I see. But we have had in the last 10 years two fatal shark attacks that we're aware of in the Northwest Atlantic area, one on Cape Cod and one up in Maine. The story on Cape Cod is probably the one that most people are familiar with. What happened was right around the year 2000, a colony of gray seals began on a part of the Cape called Chatham, Massachusetts. The seals originated in Sable Island, and they were overflow population that just found a new home. And that population has grown to well over 10,000 individuals now. And that has brought a lot of these white sharks into the area around Cape Cod, where they have been hunting for seals and interacting with people, because the Cape Cod region is a very popular tourism site. Lots of sandy beaches, slow slope going out, and it's just brought lots of people for many, many years down to the Cape for their summertime vacations. And the collision between the sharks and the the people 
has been happening on a kind of an ongoing basis. The sharks are present in the water in close to the shore all the time now. They've also been in feeding in these on these seals that are in these shallow waters hauled up on the beaches, getting used to coming in very, very close to the, the beach, which is kind of an atypical behavior compared to what white sharks do in a lot of the rest of the range of where it is. So that's been the, the start of this interaction. The fact that you've got lots of people and lots of sharks together in the same place, along with the main food supply, which is seals, for what these, these sharks are, are feeding on. So it's kind of a recipe for an occasional negative interaction between people and sharks. In terms of those interactions, um, we started with jaws, but how dangerous is the typical white shark to a human? A white shark is a big, very powerful apex predator, and it's in its home ground in the ocean. I kind of like to equate this to exactly what we do when we go into a national park where you've got cougars or where you've got large bears in the site. We don't not go into the parks. We do not refuse ourselves the opportunity to enjoy the benefits of the parks. But what we are is smart about the animals that are there and taking care not to aggravate them or to precipitate the kind of interaction that we probably would not come out on top of in those circumstances. So it's the same story with uh, the sharks in the water. What we want to do is adopt a series of behaviors on our part that would minimize the probability of a harmful interaction. How do we do that? Um, I know, you know, in various national parks, there are pretty strict guidelines. Do we have guidelines? Do we have signage or anything at our oceans out there just to make a point that these encounters are increasing and like, <laughs> here's how you not be stupid? In the Halifax region, for the first time, some form of communication signage is going up. It's being overseen by the Nova Scotia Lifeguard Service. And it's part of a beach safety program. It is not, we need to panic, there are sharks out there. And there's no reason to panic. We haven't had a fatal attack in Canadian waters since the 1800s. So we're, we're looking at a, a very, very low risk phenomena. And the way the information is being packaged is, here are a series of things you really need to know when you're heading into your beaches. In some places, we have riptides, so be careful. Don't get caught in the riptides. Certain measures you should take on the beach about if you brought your dog with you. You should not let the dog run free and, and bother other people and potentially bite other people that are present on the beach at the time. And also sharks are part of the discussion now, just saying that sharks are out in the ocean and here are things that you can do to try to avoid interacting with it. And the kinds of things that are suggested are don't swim at dawn or dusk where the peak hunting periods are for these animals and where these animals' sensory systems are finely attuned to really give the advantage to them versus anything else. Go swimming with more than one person at a time. Avoid swimming in areas with seals. And if you stay to the typical bathing beaches that most people go to, uh, those are not attractive to sharks. There, there are not the food supplies, the seals hauling up on those because the seals don't like to be around all those people all the time. And so there's no reason for the sharks to be there. And you do all of that, you're in a situation where you have a practically zero chance of encountering a shark. I was going to ask you, you know, what makes a shark more or less likely to actually engage uh, with a human who's swimming or, you know, someone on one of those open paddle boards or a kayak? So clearly the sharks that we're talking about here, the white sharks, are not targeting people because we would have a whole lot more reports of injuries and, and fatalities if they were. Right. So that begins to lead you to a discussion of what could possibly be going on. And the, the prime theory now is that we're talking about mistaken identity. In our context, where we're looking at a white shark population that's recovering and where the sharks that we're seeing which are migrating into our waters to go feeding for the, the summer, a lot of them are sub-adults. They're right on the verge of making a transition from when they're juveniles and they feed on fish and they have teeth that are designed really like spikes to, to spear fish to something that has teeth that are triangular and serrated and designed to carve up seals as they shift their predation over onto these marine mammals for the next rest of their lives. In that transition period where the, the sub-adults are making the move from feeding on fish to feeding on seals, they need to learn what a seal is and how do you hunt a seal and where do you find seals. And a surfer 
for example, lying on top of a board with its arms and legs extended, viewed from down below, deep, where the sharks like to rush up from in their attack mode, would look an awful lot like a seal, especially to an inexperienced animal. And so we think a lot of it is driven by these mistaken identities in a very, very high proportion globally of the shark attacks that do occur are on surfers like that. What do you see happening five or 10 years down the line if, uh, whether it's due to uh, the resurgence of the population and and less fishing, or as these waters, uh, as they're going to do, continue to warm, will people living off the Northwest Atlantic need to change the way they engage with the ocean? So I come back to my national park analogy. Um, I think that becoming shark smart in that way, exactly like we would be bear smart around a park, is going to become something that we would want to be promoting. In terms of the shark population, nothing goes up forever. At some point in time, it gets limited by things. Right now, as these animals are coming in and reoccupying territory that they traditionally occupied and beginning to field on a burgeoning seal population that we have here in the Maritimes, you would expect to see changes occurring to the seal populations. It would decline a bit. It would change its behavior, which begins to limit the ability of the sharks to find food, which begins to limit the ability of the shark population to continue growing. So we'll look at some sort of equilibrium being established and For humans, what that means, though, is that we just stick to the shark smart plan. Fred, thank you so much for this. It's uh, really insightful, and I'm uh, I'm excited, I guess, even though people might be nervous that these creatures are back in numbers in our waters. Thank you very much again for the invitation. It's been a pleasure. Fred Wariski of Dalhousie University. That was the big story. You can find tons of other big stories, hundreds of them, in fact, by going to thebigstorypodcast.ca. You can send us hundreds of emails, if you want, by sending them to hello at thebigstorypodcast.ca. Or you can call and just leave us a voicemail or two, please not hundreds, because i got to listen to them all. The phone number to do that is 416-935-5935. You can find this podcast and every podcast player you like, and you can ask for it on your smart speaker by saying, play the Big Story podcast. Thanks for listening. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. We'll talk tomorrow.